You know, when I first met you, you were talking about all these children you have. And I'm like, where's she getting all these? You adopted how many children now? Eight. Eight children. Why do you, why did you do, adopt the first one? And what brought you in that journey? Well, you know, I think God places um, the, the ministry of adoption and the thought of adoption in your heart for a long time before it's, he calls you to an action step. So um, I, my husband and I were dating, we were 17 years old. We were just sitting in his parents' car, riding out the last 10, 15 minutes of my curfew in my parents' driveway and just talking about the future and like, well, how many kids would you want? You know, or, and I'm like, wait, wait, don't say it. I don't want to influence your answer. You know, so we both wrote a number on a piece of paper and we passed it to each other. It was the same number. Um, ironically, it was five. <laughs> so uh, God overshot that uh, <laughs> goal um, big time. But we did talk about that night. And that was the first time we had a conversation and that, that we thought adoption would be a part of our story at some point. And I guess at that point, just the naivety of 17, you know, we thought, well, we'll have a few biological children. And then uh, once we get the hang of parenting, then maybe we'll, we'll adopt too. But we had a lot of close family friends who had either adopted or fostered for years and years and years. It was very common conversation um, nearby. It wasn't like a remote thing that I didn't really understand, but I hadn't lived it which made for a different level of understanding for sure. So we had, all, we had talked about it long before we even got engaged or anything. And so it wasn't a big surprise when God did call us to take some action steps, but we did think we did pursue biologically um, for many years and through many doctors and through some losses. Um, and then um, I was actually teaching preschool Sunday school. And uh, one of the parents of the kids that I served was a family judge. And she said, why don't you just adopt? There's so many kids, so many kids that need families. And, um, and I see them come through my courtroom every day. Wouldn't you call me tomorrow? And we'll talk about it. So that spurred a conversation that then put me back in, in the hands of a Girl Scout friend. So we'd been Girl Scouts together and uh, she was a social worker by then. And we went through a, a private agency where the birth mothers actually got to read your bio and choose uh, what family their children would go to. And so we got chosen very quickly. Um, it surprised all of us. And um, by three months later, we were standing in a hospital pacing the floor with with her relatives waiting, waiting for him to be born. Um, that became an open adoption and uh, she came for his high school. We met a lot over the years and uh, back and forth doing fun things together and um, going to her wedding. And, uh, and then she came here uh, for his high school graduation and then for his wedding. And um, it has been really fun. And now we are both grandparents. Wow. And so our journey <laughs> continues and um, I love her to death. We have, we have run through some muck and mire um, together and some really um, victorious moments too. So she's real special to us. I love that story. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. You know, one thing that's just, was just so striking about that particular relationship is it started off. She was very, very young. And, um, and, you know, I wasn't her mom and I wasn't her age, but I was younger than her mom. So we had this friendship and then we had this sisterhood when she got married. And then when she had another child, you know, then it was like, I don't want to call my mom and say this, but, oh gosh, you know, what am I going to do with this, this child? She's exactly like me <laughs> or whatever. I'm like, well, I have the other one that's exactly like both of us. So okay. I get it. But. But then when, when Josh got married, then um, he said, you know, we're not going to do the mother son dance. We're not going to do the, the dance. And I'm like, okay, fine. That's great. And then at the reception, he's like, okay, okay, we're doing it. So panic. <laughs> so I grab this song and I go over to her and I go, Hey, he wants to do the mother's son dance. And she's like, Oh, that's good. And I'm like, no, the mother's plural. <laughs> and she goes, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, no, you raised him. You, This is yours. This is yours. I'm like, oh, no, you got me into this. We're both doing it. <laughs> and so it was really special. I went out to start the dance with him. 
And then partway through the song, we pulled her in and the three of us danced together. And then I walked away and she finished it. And it was the most spectacular culmination of sharing motherhood with her and just having that she had that role. That is her role too. And being able to share that and share that that um, position of honor there at the wedding was just really, really, it was like the whole rest of the world just drifted away. It was just three of us for a little while. It was just really special. God just really anointed that moment. That's, that's great. Well, you didn't stop there. No. no. What happened next after her? Yeah. So we got relocated and we were kind of new to our, the area that we were living at the time. And when we got relocated, our finances changed a lot because I needed to stay home and um, not work, which meant no savings building, no anything, and definitely no saving up towards, you know, another adoption. Um, but God still provided for that in this the craziest way. You know, when he wants to send you money to do something, he doesn't need all kinds of heroic efforts. He just is going to do it if it's his will, you know. And so we got a chance to adopt and they were interested in doing an open adoption too. And so we got to meet the birth parents um, and um, meet their families um, and just really hear their hearts uh, for this child. And so then he was born. And again, we're pacing the floor at the hospital at the same hospital with one same nursing staff. Um, in the delivery room. And that that's great. I mean, I'm the oldest of four kids born in five and a half years, and none of us were born at the same hospital. So here's my two adopted kids from completely different families born in the same hospital and one of the same nurses. And so it was really special to have that too. And um, and then that open adoption has just been spectacular, super supportive family. Um, again, went to her wedding, have championed when she's had her kids too. And um, then she came here for high school graduation and 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 we've uh, continued to go back and forth and, and, and things. So another, another win there. And uh, yeah, well, that's a blessing. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of it people. It doesn't always work that way. You know, no, you no. don't always have the opportunity and you don't always have the, um, the, the right combination, you know? That's right. Uh, um, everybody processes all those things differently and has different thresholds of trust and all that. So it's, it's a different situation for everybody for sure. Yeah. So then we moved again. And that point I went on staff at a church um, in the Atlanta area and I met this family who was doing foster care. And so we had two kids at home and this family kept coming in each Sunday. I watched as the children that they were caring for went from eyes on the floor, shame, body language, um, to pulling their foster parents through the door, skipping and singing and eyes up and full of life. And I was like, look at the transformation of these children how can I ask God for another, we call it Gerber baby, like a perfect baby through adoption when there's so many children in foster care that really need temporary or permanent homes. And I want to be a part of that solution. And it didn't take much talking to my husband to get, to, you know, for him to say yes, he knew that family too. And he knew I'd been watching and I kept commenting. I'm not very um, subtle. So, um, and we, we know that. We know yeah. that. <laughs> I'm not a good poker player either because there's no secrets on my face. So, <laughs> um, so we got into foster care and um, we had a little girl with us um, for about eight months. And then during that time, we had another baby with us. Um, and we thought for sure that um, her dad would be able to work his plan and regain um, his privilege of parenting. And it was the opposite. The first one that was... was the handwriting seemed to be on the wall, went home. And the second one uh, is now 24 <laughs> in, oh. in the other end of the house. So, so, so she joined our family and we took a break um, at that point. Cause now we had uh, three kids and we had um, only uh, two bedrooms in the house. And so that meant genders were obviously split. And if we were going to grow anymore, we needed to do some remodeling and we needed to have some time to, regroup as a family now that she was going to be permanent and, and joining us there. And so we did, we took a little pause. Um, and during that time I had a couple of surgeries and we had a couple of, uh, 
job funny things happening uh, with lots and lots of travel that didn't make it make us a two parent family for very long, uh, often enough. And so um, when he got out of that travel cycle, then we we opened up again. And um, and I said, you know, I I know a lot of people uh, don't want to take the babies in foster care because they're in intensive work. They if if you work outside the home, it's it's challenging, um, depending on where you live, how, what services are provided and stuff. But I said, but give me all the babies. I'll, I love the babies. Um, and so they're like, well, now, you know, we don't have a lot of babies and everybody wants the babies. But, you know, whatever. I'm like, oh, OK. All right. So a week later, I had um, two under 17 months that were siblings. And by uh, 10 and a half months later, I had their their younger brother was born too. So they went from, no, no, we don't have any babies to, I have all three, I have three babies um, and they're full siblings and only 29 months apart. So Irish triplets. Um, and that case went on for quite a while. And there was a lot of um, ups and downs and really hard things, really, really hard things um, in their family story. And, um, and then we got moved again. And so um Several years after we uh, moved here, uh, we were able to finalize their adoption. And um, that was really special. It felt very long. It felt very drawn out and un unnecessarily laborious um, because it was between two states. But the beauty of it was, and this is what I didn't understand when the waiting felt ugly, was they were old enough to remember going to court and the judge changing their name. And we've maintained a, a relationship because we do a lot of volunteer work with family court here. And so we've continued on uh, with that judge and checking in with her and and uh, doing some special projects and stuff with her, too. And um, so it's been really fun every time she's uh, up for reelection or whatever. The kids will, yay, you know, yay at the sign. Hey, there's our judge. That's our judge. And um, and so they they just love her and. Um, one of the special things that happened um, in that hearing is, you know, everybody has to raise their hand and promise to tell the truth and swear to what they're committing to and stuff. And so here's three little hands who don't even know what swearing the truth necessarily means because they were preschoolers, but they raised their hand and they kept whispering while the judge is going through all the jargon of the legal action that's happening. Did she do it? Did she do it? Did she change my name? Did she change my name? And afterwards, uh, you know, she she did each one had to be read separately, each each child and stuff. So when she did it, you know, and then I'm, I did it, I did it. Oh, I'm weak from at heart. I'm weak from at heart now um, and on paper. And so then at the end, um, one of the little kids <laughs> went up to her and she bent right down in her big black robe, almost to the ground, you know, and he said, thank you. But I was already a Wickstrom in my heart, but thank you for printing the paper. That was nice. <laughs> like, like it was just, just, she was just having to do, go through some motion that he already had accepted long ago in his heart. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it was, it was really sweet. And it was, she still talks about it and it's been 12 years and she still talks about it. And so that's, that's dear to me that he remembers that. And that with all the things that come before her all the time, those little days of happy court for her are, are very memorable and, um, you know, a positive part of what she does in family court too. So it didn't stop there. Although we thought we were kind of pulling our weight <laughs> with, with that and six kids did seem like a lot since we, you know, our 17 year old selves had thought about five. Um, and uh, we we're serving in our church and my husband calls me uh, from a meeting at church and says, uh, uh, our pastor just handed me this piece of paper and said, there's a child in New York city that is from China that needs to be adopted. It needs somebody who's already you know, cleared and all this other stuff. And I was like, wow, we, we said, we felt like God was doing something, bringing a change right now. Do you think this is it? He goes, I kept thinking that was not it that, you know, we had checked the box on that, but oh, here we go. Well, that was not, but it was time to get us to the next intersection for God to do a left turn. And we ended up uh, finding about finding out from some missionary friends about two boys in China that were going to age out of the system 
in China, you age out at 14, not 18. And um, I don't know if you were equipped for the world to be on your own at 14, but I, I was sure not. And these guys were sure not. But so here we go. And now we're going overseas and we're getting, getting two boys turning 14 as as we're getting there. It was unprecedented timing to be able to do two international adoptions in the span of seven months. That just does not happen. Um, so God just really moved mountains on both sides of the ocean and uh, did phenomenal, phenomenal things. And we came sliding into JFK with 28 hours to spare for Ethan turning 14, which still makes me take like a big gasping breath. Um, and those guys have now been home for 10 years and they are graduated from high school and they have full-time jobs and they finally learn to drive and get their licenses after COVID and um, are, are doing pretty well. And, and so that rounds out the eight. They did not come in birth order. They did not come in 10 month increments. We have two sets of Irish triplets within that, that grouping uh, because at the time that we went to China to adopt two boys turning 14, we had a 13 and a half year old. So um, there is never a dull moment and um, God has been so faithful, so faithful to just build our family in a way we could have never dreamed, would have never even dared to dream um, and, and work through their losses and their hardships and their unknown parts of their story in such a beautiful way and such a difficult way. Um, you know, not, nothing worthwhile comes easy. Um, and that's certainly been the, the case. I don't want in a summary of how our children were added to sound like it's over romanticized and we just are one big, happy, you know, family. We're much more like a reality show. Uh, and um, there's there's just so much when kids come from hard places whether you bring them home brand new, they still have suffered the loss of their first family and the unknowns that come with that. I mean, some, some answers we have, some we will never have. Um, and living within the tensions of those things. And some of our adoptions are kind of conspicuous. Uh, my husband's six foot tall, blonde haired and blue eyed, and I'm five feet nothing with, well, it used to be brown hair. It's a little more salt and pepper these days. And brown eyes. So we can kind of make a lot of combinations until you throw the two Chinese kids in. Then we don't, it doesn't work <laughs> that way, you know? So then people ask a lot of questions, you know, and some of them are appropriate and some of them cross a line. And so we have to kind of model for our kids how to field those questions because they don't have to tell their whole story just because somebody asks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's theirs to hold and theirs to tell if they choose to reveal anything about it. Uh, so that's a different part of being a fully adopted family is, you know, we have to shepherd that story and it's not any other kid's privilege to tell somebody else's stories. There's been a lot of nuances with that, but mm -hmm. just God's been so good to take us through the hard places, even when we had to kind of stay in those valleys for long seasons mm -hmm. and just parallel that to the gospel and that we would all be lost if we hadn't been adopted by him. Absolutely. Um, and his sovereignty in building their testimonies and our testimony in, in those hard places and in those fun places has just been a wild ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some, oh. some rides are really fun and you're like, do it again. And some rides you just want to throw up and that's part of it, all part of it, you know? Yeah. So let me, let me ask you a question. What would you tell someone that might be sitting on the fence of adopting a child? Yeah. So, um, kind of being cheeky, I would say if you're looking for a soul cleanse, this is a great program because uh, if you have any, uh, you know, <laughs> pride or entitlement, or you think you're going to get this and it's going to be easy, uh, God's going to help straighten that thought out pretty quickly um, for you and for them. Because sometimes the older kids come with some ideas of what this is going to be like too, and, and those collide. Um, but God's just so good through all of it when you surrender it to him. When it's his when it's his call, the doors will open and the timing will be there. 
and he will be there to walk you through those hard places and stand right next to you for the things that we just applaud and cheer for. So it's not just um, a way to build your family. Um, it's not a magic thing. It will not save a marriage. Definitely not going to be a tonic for that. Uh, I think sometimes it's romanticized to the point that if we just love them, it'll, everything will be happily ever after. Well, and then you're, we're kind of dismissing the grief that they have experienced by having a big loss uh, to start with. So I think giving uh, that balance of that hope um, and the love and the reality of that, and then um, having people around you who have walked that road before to uh, really be seen and known um, because it is a very different kind of life. Uh, it is a good life, but it is a very different kind of life. And it comes with a lot of things that don't happen in typical biological families. So um, I would encourage them to seek the Lord for sure first and ask, like, when was the first time you think God might have planted the seed of adoption um, in your story? And, and why now? Why now um, for action steps? I pray this program has strengthened and encouraged you. Paul says in Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Has God placed adoption on your heart? Will you prayerfully consider opening your home up to a child who needs love and care? God speaks to you every day. Are you listening to the call?